Thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus, and thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's so faithful to lead us, guide us, direct us. And, uh, you know, there was a time, Father, when I used to think that following the leading of the Holy Spirit was searching out in my mind and analyzing in my mind all of the options and trying to decide which one would be most pleasing to you. But Father, I'm finding every day that the Holy Spirit leads me 24 hours a day, and for most of all of this time, I'm totally unaware that he's leading me, taking us where he wants us to be, doing through us and in us what he wants to do, working all things together for our good and your glory. I just thank you now in anticipation of that day when faith will become sight, I will be able to see and comprehend the great faithfulness of the Lord Jesus to me. Uh, I do love you, Lord Jesus. <clears throat> You're so precious to me. Father, we pray that the the Holy Spirit might be at work here in our hearts this morning, enabling us to hear whatever He would have to say to the saints of God. Bless those who hear this message by tape. May it meet a special need in their hearts. I ask you that it might meet the need of my own heart, that I might be able to hear first what you have to say. May Jesus precious to us and make this a very special time for each of us. We might come away I'm glad that we were here. And Father, for those who perhaps came from some other motive because it was the joy and desire of their heart to be here, we pray that when they leave, it, they will have learned that the real need and the real desire and the real joy of their heart really was to be here and to hear thy word and to be with those who know and love thee. Thank you for the fellowship that we have with each other, who are truly yours. And thank you for the reality of Jesus. Pray that no man may see <clears throat> the vessel that stands here this morning. And may they hear no voice but the voice of him who will speak in us and through us. And may they see no face save the face of him who is altogether lovely. And this is Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> I'd like to read uh, some selected portions. I sound like I'm reading poetry. Some selected portions, and then give you some random and perhaps some selected thoughts, too on a great subject, which I will announce after I read the text, because you won't be able to tell from the scripture what I'm going to preach about. I asked Joey coming down to meeting this morning, what do you think I'm going to preach about this morning? He said, Jesus. And I said, that wasn't too bad a guess for just one try, because you're at least close. I'd like to read, uh, I think, in Hebrews 11 first. You won't see any connection for just a little while, but these scriptures will come up in the message, and then you'll see the connection. In Hebrews 11, we are told about Abraham, about how he was called to go out to a place which he should have to receive for an inheritance, and he didn't know where he was going. So in verse 13, it tells how after he had wandered around over the earth, these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off. And there's a word picture here, like a seaman that's been at sea for a long time. And he sails within sight of his home port, but he can't land. And so we have this picture of Abraham in relationship to the promises which God had, seen, had given him. He saw them afar off. But he was never able to land. He never really obtained these promises, laid hold of the reality of them. He only had these promises by faith. 
he was persuaded of them and he embraced them and it made him confess that he was a stranger and a pilgrim on the earth for they that say such things declare plainly that they're still looking for their homeland for truly if they had only been talking about their earthly homeland that land from whence they came they could just as well have packed up and gone back but now they desire a better country that is in heavenly where for God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city in John 14 just some selected verses at the first verse let not your heart be troubled Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How then could we possibly know the way? And he said to him, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And he could have added, I am also my father's house. And I am also the mansion. And I am also the place. For no man can come to the father but by me. Then in the same chapter, verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. And I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, Not as Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto mankind? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode, or take up our permanent habitation, our dwelling place, settle down and be at home in him. And in verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. And I'd like to read in Second Timothy, and I'm positive that by now you're totally baffled. In Second Timothy chapter 4, Paul giving his farewell message in a letter to Timothy knows that he's about to leave this world he says in verse 6 for I'm now ready to be offered and the time to take down my tent and march the time to hoist the anchor and sail away is now at hand I have fought the good fight I have finished my course I have kept the faith and henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also which love his appearing. As they say on those little tele, tele commercials, the word is home. H O M E, home. And that's the word we're going to consider this morning. You probably hadn't noticed, but this is the season to be jolly. Are you jolly? And you will note that in this season, which is Christmas season, I suppose that home becomes probably the most important word of all. It's the key word. All the emphasis is on home. And between now and next Sunday, or next Saturday night rather, which is Christmas Eve, people all over the world will stop whatever it is they're doing get on a train or a plane or a boat or in their automobiles or hitchhike or walk or ride a bicycle or any way they can get there and they'll all head for one place and that place is called home that's all they'll talk about all week long is going home for Christmas servicemen all over the world those who can get away will leave their posts and go home and every time this season rolls around, it's like a giant magnet. Tremendous pull, pressure that men can't resist all over the world. They feel it start tugging along about the 1st of December or Thanksgiving or whatever. They begin to feel that pull toward home. 
And so that up until the 25th, at least, of December, all of their efforts are geared to one thing, and that's being where they want to be more than anything else and any place else on the face of the earth, and that's home for Christmas. You've probably been hearing the songs, I'll be home for Christmas. Home for Christmas. That's what they're singing about. And you'll probably get to see that special on TV this week called The Homecoming. And all the commercials will have fireplaces with a fire going in them and a Christmas tree with uh, decorations on them. And all the emphasis will be on the family, home, being in that one sacred place for at least that one day of this present year. And I think that if you... Maybe you haven't thought much about home and Christmas, but if you think about it, you will see that people all over the world have been busy for 365 days this past year, and uh, most of them don't know who they are, and most of them don't know where they are, most of them don't know where they've been or where they're going, and this is the one day they'll try to get it all together, try to find that one geographical spot where they belong. They'll kind of just migrate to that one spot where they can give a sigh of relief and say, I feel at home. Now, I know you probably thought I was going to talk about Santa Claus, but I feel pretty kindly towards Santa Claus because I decided that uh, the world needs him. They don't have anybody else. They need him. I don't need him, but the world sure needs him. And uh, without Santa Claus and all the hope that's related to Santa Claus uh, type of thinking, you know, uh, the world would die. They would perish. And so I, I don't begrudge them Santa Claus because if they can't have the real thing, they need something. And I'm not going to talk about Santa Claus. I would like to talk to you about this one great word, which is home. And I'd like to tell you that my heart's desire this morning... And my wish this morning for myself and for you, and this is my holiday wish for you, is I wish and I desire that I, as well as you, might be home for Christmas. I want to go home for Christmas. Would you like to go home for Christmas? I'm homesick, really homesick, and it's been a long time, and I want to go home. That's where I want to be on Christmas Eve, and that's where I want to be on Christmas Day. And I I pray for you, and I pray for myself that we'll all be home for Christmas. I got a birthday present the other day that I love very, very much. And I can't really describe it to you, but maybe someday I can show it to you. It's a picture done with yarn. You probably have a name for that. I don't know what it is. There's a very, very beautiful picture, and it shows the sun going down, and there's a, there's a ship out in the sea. And you're looking through a part of a dock or a part of a wharf. The, the picture wouldn't have been worth a whole lot if it hadn't been for the inscription under it, and the inscription uh, touched me very deeply, and... Uh, I haven't been able to get this word home off my heart since I got the picture. And the inscription is next port, home. Next port, home. And that started me thinking about home, an awful lot about home. And of course, being the type of person that has to analyze and dig down there and find the bottom line, I decided that the first thing I'd have to do would be find out where it is. If I had any hopes of getting home for Christmas, I'd have to find out, first of all, how to get there, and I'd have to find out where it is. You say to someone, are you going home for Christmas yet? Where are you going? I don't know. It'd be kind of dumb. I want to be home for Christmas, so I'll have to find out where home is. And that may seem like a, a, a trifling point. But I believe that most of the people who go home for Christmas this year will go home and still not know where home is. I think many of them will travel to a spot on the earth and say, this is it. 
And the day after Christmas, we'll realize that they were just as far away from home as they ever were. Do you believe that? I remember one time in a time of great distress in my life, and I was weeping and sobbing. And someone said, Why are you sobbing and what are you weeping about? And I just blurted out what was on my heart. It didn't make any sense, and I hadn't even analyzed what was there, but I just blurted out what was down inside, and it went like this. I want to go home, but I don't know where home is. Did you ever have an overwhelming desire to go home, coupled with the frustration of not knowing where it was? That's bad news. I want to go home. But if you don't know where home is, you can't go. Homesickness is a terrible thing. It's an incurable thing. No doctor can prescribe any medicine to you that will lift the, the hurt of homesickness. It just lingers on. <laughs> you can dull its senses with drink or with drug, or you can drown out its sound with uh, all kinds of music and laughter, but you can't get rid of homesickness. It will eat away down inside of you, and it will hurt you. It will pain you and wound you. And there's no one can relieve your homesickness. And, and if any of you have ever experienced homesickness, you'll know that some of the worst homesickness you ever experienced was when you were right at the very place you thought was home. It's like being lonely in a crowd. Because what I'm saying to you is that home <clears throat> is not a geographical location. Home is not one particular spot on the earth. People who know where home is are at home wherever they are. And home isn't necessarily related to people. For some of the worst homesickness in the world, as I've already related to you, is suffered in the presence of many people. Home isn't related to a house. Houses are made of wood and stone and nails. Any carpenter can build a house. No man on earth can make it home. All the emphasis, for instance, uh, at Christmas time is on home, and all the emphasis in the building of houses is on home. You buy home furnishings. We're building new homes. You can decorate a house. You can paint it. You can remodel it. You can spend a million dollars on the interior as well as the exterior, but you can't make a home out of it. House doesn't constitute a home. People don't constitute a home. And home certainly is not a geographical location. Now, having already established the fact that the word home is a little elusive, I would like to try and define it for you. There are many answers. And there's all kinds of cliches connected with the word home. There's no place like home. That's true. Home, sweet home. That's true. Home is where the heart is. That's true. And, and home is a very elusive term, and it, it's very, very hard to pin it down. But I think if I describe to you perhaps a little more what home is, your heart will tell you that I found the secret meaning of the word heart, uh, the word home. Now, some of you won't, because some of you will not even be able to vaguely relate to home as I describe it to you. But I'll just throw this out. It don't have a thing to do with what I'm talking about right now. But I'll throw this out, and, and isn't it strange that most people, when they get a real bad case of homesickness, their, their hearts go back with a desire to go back to that first home. The other day... 
just suddenly, like a wave, it just rolled over me. It wasn't anything I'd been thinking about at all. I wasn't dwelling on the past. I wasn't remembering uh, back yonder. Just driving along. All of a sudden, like a big wave of sickness, this thing came over my heart, and, and I wanted to go back home to my little bed over on William Street, about four or five blocks from here. And I wanted to go upstairs and get in that little bed. I wanted to get down Mother's knees and let her read out the Bible story book again to me. I don't know why. But when I thought of home, that's where I want to go. I was just drawn like a big magnet back there. Well, you say it's just that you're out there coping with the problems of life and butting your head up against reality and back there you didn't have any responsibility and back there you didn't have any burdens and back there you didn't have any bills to pay and back there you didn't have any problems. All you did was just go to bed at night and get up in the morning, play all day and go back to bed again at night. That's what I did, but there's more to home than just being able to play all day and not having any responsibility or not having any burdens or not having any problems. My heart was drawn back there, as you will hear in the message, because I remember back yonder when I was a little boy, at least you see my vision, what I saw and what I felt and what I remember from back there, I was really at home because... of who I was and my relationship to the people in that house. So I'll tell you a little more about that, okay? Keep tantalizing you or something. If you take your concordance and uh, look up some of the words in the Bible where home is mentioned or alluded to in some way, you'd be amazed at the definitions you come up with. So I'm going to give you some technical information about home and then I'm going to tell you out of my heart what I think home really is. As I looked up the word in the Hebrew, my, I found that if I said home was elusive, it was like a phantom when I began to find it in the Hebrew. Because I found that the word that was translated home over and over in the Old Testament Scriptures was also translated in different ways than just home. So apparently the word was pretty big. And let me just give you, I jotted them down, and I want to give to you the different ways this word is translated in the Old Testament. In one place, we read the same word, only it's translated temple, a place where you worship. I found it in another verse, but it was translated a web, like a spider's web. I found it translated in another place as a palace. A place where a man is king. And in another place, translated a prison where a man is confined. I found it translated just simply as a place. Vague, just a place. I found, found it translated as a ward where a man is detained or put in detention. I found it also translated by our word family. And I found it translated in another place as a dungeon where a man set in chains without light and without hope. So you see, an earthly home can be anything. You call it home, it may be a dungeon for someone who lives there. You say it's home, it may be a palace, because you may be king. Your home may be my prison. My prison may be your home, right? My dungeon may be your freedom. Your freedom may be my dungeon. Your home may be a temple to you, for true worship is there. Another man's home might be a temple of demons, 
where God is not honored. So therefore, if we're talking about earthly homes, because that's what this word refers to, it apparently takes on the character of whoever lives there. If the man who lives there is a king, then it's a palace. If he's a worshiper, it's a temple. If he's a prisoner, it's a dungeon. If he's bound, it's a ward. If he's caught and can't get out, it's a web. If he has no heart involvement either way, it's just a place. Any four walls and any roof will do as long as it keeps the rain and the wind off. And that's what the Hebrew has to say about the word home. Isn't that interesting? That's worth coming out to hear, isn't it? Now when we get into the Greek, and believe me, I'm no Greek scholar. I've told you many times the only Greek I ever knew was the guy ran the fruit stand. Now, when you get into the Greek, you find that the word home in several key passages, especially in a passage which I haven't yet read, read to you in 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul sp- talks about being absent from the body to be present with the Lord. He talks about being at home in the body, but absent from the Lord, and therefore being present with the Lord is the same as being at home with the Lord. This word there, and used many other times in the New Testament to signify home, is the word idios. That's strange, because this word means, listen carefully, one's very own. One's own private thing, characteristic, whatever. Idiosyncrasy is a word we get from this root word. It means something separate from everybody else. Something private and separate and something that belongs to me all by myself. Because the word idios in its final countdown comes to this, pertaining to the self. And so we speak of the id in us. And this word is translated home in the New Testament. Are you getting any light? Now, it doesn't have anything to do with a geographical location. I read to you from Hebrews 11. Now, bring this passage into into conjunction with the message. It describes Abraham as having received the promises of God. He was persuaded of them in his heart, and he embraced them, but at a distance. That is, he was not enabled to really go home in the sense of having the promises fulfilled really for him then. And he's described in this little word picture as a homesick sailor who's been at sea for a long time. And he sails within sight of home, but he can't land. That was the misery that Abraham experienced in his heart. While on this earth, and he confessed that that feeling down inside of him made him feel like a pilgrim and a stranger. In other words, he said, I'll have to confess that while on this earth, because of the promises of God, I can't find home. Yet the writer of Hebrews says, I know he wasn't referring to his homeland. For had he been referring to his homeland, he could have just packed up and gone home. Abraham couldn't go home for Christmas. He couldn't go home because he didn't know where home was. He was still looking for home. He was looking for home because he had the promise from God that there was a home for him, but he'd never got there yet. And so he wandered the earth like a pilgrim, like a stranger, just seen at a distance through the eyes of faith, there in the, ma- in the haze and in the fog, the vision of home. And when they said, why don't you go back to Macedonia if you're so homesick, Abraham would have said, it's not Macedonia I'm homesick for. 
I desire a better country, a place where God is not ashamed to be surnamed my God. Isn't that wonderful? Wonderful. That Abraham was home. He's there now. But he never made it during his lifetime. He sailed close enough to see it. Oh, he was within hailing distance the day he stood on Mount Moriah. And he saw Isaac stressed over the altar, was he not? He saw the day when he could come home, but he wasn't allowed to go then. But he rejoiced in the anticipation of it. Okay, so home, you see, as it was with Abraham, doesn't have to do with uh, geographical location because some of you may find this out. You will go to your house for Christmas and you may have the realization that you're not home. I'll tell you what home is, dear people. <clears throat> I'm going to read it to you from 2 Corinthians 5, and you know the answer as well as I. Home is a person. Now, we have to get beyond that this morning. I mean, we can't just sit here and say, you know, it's a person. So, whoop de doo and forget that. We have to get on beyond that and find out why the only home any of us will ever find is in a person. Because if home is really a person, then we're going to discover why a person can be home to us. And if we do, we'll have to discover what home really is. And if we discover what home is, we'll find out it's related to this word translated home that I said was idioms, pertaining to self. One's own peculiar, one's very own, one's private, separate thing, person, characteristic, whatever. It's where id, it's where self, it's where the little man inside is fulfilled. To use simpler terms, where he's happy, where he's at home. Let me read in Second Corinthians 5. We know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, this tent home, were dissolved or halts for the night, can't go any further, it's all right. We have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And you know, just now, I've been thinking about this verse for a while, and I don't think this building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens necessarily has to do with another body. I think it may have very much to do with the fact that we who are the saints of God, we who have been saved, are that eternal building of God not made with hands where He will eternally dwell. We're a part of that. Each one of us not only is a part of God's eternal building not made with hands, but we are that eternal building not made with hands. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And then in another place we're told the church is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Each one of us as a Christian, each believer, each one united to the Lord Jesus is a temple in himself as well as being a stone in that one great temple which will be the eternal habitation of God. So I'm not sure this has reference to an earthly body, but nevertheless he is talking about his earthly tabernacle. And he says, In this earthly tabernacle I am groaning, and I have an earnest desire to be clothed upon with a house which is from heaven. If so, that being clothed we shall not be found naked. We that are in this tabernacle groan and are burdened, not that we want to be naked. It's not a negative aspect. It's not that I just want to be stripped of this mortal body only. It is that I want to be clothed. And I want mortality to be swallowed up of life. <laughs> mortality, which is death, the capacity to die and the ability to die, swallowed up, gone, devoured by life. 
Now, he that has wrought us for this selfsame thing is God. This is what he made us for. And he has given to us the down payment, the assurance, the absolute assurance of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we go about with a perpetual kind of confidence, knowing that while I am at home in this body, I am absent from the Lord. And let me just give the true sense. While I am at home in this body, I am away from home as far as the Lord is concerned. So I'm walking by faith, that is, not by sight. But you say, the Lord is home with me now. True. But I can't see Him. I'm still walking by faith. And there are times when I can't hear Him. I'm still hearing by faith. Right? And I'm walking by faith. So it's not like being home where I will no longer depend on faith, where faith will die and go away and be finished, swallowed up of love, that's all that will remain, faith, hope, and charity, these three, but this remains, love. And so there will be a day when I don't have to strain my spiritual eyes to see Him, strain my spiritual ears to hear Him, strain my spiritual emotions to feel Him, when I will literally, actually, and in every sense of the word, be embraced by His arms as my arms embrace His, see His face as He sees mine now, hear His voice as He hears me, know Him as He knows me. Until that moment comes, I am absent from the Lord in the sense I am not at home. Therefore, I'm a pilgrim <laughs> and a stranger. But I do know this. I'm willing as well as confident. I would rather be away from home in regards to my body and be present or at home with the Lord. Let me read it another way. I would rather be absent from my body, that is, not have any more capacity to hear earthly voices, see earthly faces, touch and feel earthly things. Oh, I would rather give that all up. To be at home with Jesus. The word is home. It is a person. Now, the word home in this passage in 2 Corinthians 5 is not the word idios. It's another word. And this little word here <coughs> is the word demos. And you probably don't recognize that, but it simply means to be in one's place. But there's a little more depth to it than that. It's the root of our word democratic or democracy. And the word demos means persons bound or people bound together socially. Isn't that what democracy is all about? It means to bind together, to knit together, to tie together with bonds. And this is the word that the Holy Spirit uses here in 2 Corinthians 5 to speak about me being at home with Jesus. To be at home with Jesus, I'm at home with Jesus because I'm bound to Him socially. You with me? I've been knit together with Him. I've been tied together with Him. With Jesus, I'm in my own place. Fulfilled. Completed. Lacking nothing. Sensing no absence from anything or anybody. Feeling fully at home with all and with whom all are a part of my home. You understanding me? Okay. Now, home has to be a two-way street. Just because two people live in the same house doesn't necessarily make it home to both people. 
it might be home to one and not home at all to another. One may very well be at home in your house on Christmas Day. Another may be in your same house and feel absent. True? Why? Because home is a two-way street. It's more than just me being fulfilled. If Jesus is my home and I'm fulfilled in Him... It's also true that he must be at home in me. And he must be fulfilled in me, otherwise it's not a happy home. What's home for one may be a prison for another. And if Jesus and I have found home in each other, it simply means that he and I have found the fulfillment, the completion of each other in each other. And that's what makes Jesus my home. But we, we, we hear preaching about this from time to time, that Jesus is our home. But we ought to preach also on the fact that we are His home. And we're the only home that He has. Jesus didn't have a home while He was on the earth. And I hesitate to say this, but He understands me. He didn't have a home before he came to the earth. That's what he came for. He came home. He came seeking home. He came to be fulfilled. He came to be completed. He came to come to rest. Did he not? He came to finish and fulfill and accomplish all of his goals, all of his heart's desires, all of his purposes. He came to find the one thing he lacked. He never had it when he was on the earth, and he never had it before he came. He had a house, but he had no home, for it is not good that man should live alone. He had a house. His front yard was filled with stars and planets. He had neighbors. He had a hundred thousand million angels to tell his praises and his worth. But he left his house to come home for Christmas. And the going home of God began at Bethlehem as far as earth's history is concerned, did it not? And all the time he was on this earth, he never called a single place home. A pilgrim and a stranger, yet not restless, but the most rested man who ever lived. True? True? The difference between a restless man and a man who's homeless, they may be one and the same in some cases, but not always. A man can be homeless and not restless. Jesus was not restless, but he had no home. One day he said, the birds of the air have their nests, the foxes have their dens, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Now, it's either a true statement or a false statement. Now, if he referred to a place to lay his earthly head, that is, a place to sleep at night, that was a lie, because he had places to sleep. He slept. He stayed at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home. So, you see, home doesn't necessarily just mean a place where there's a bed. Motels have beds, but nobody would call them home. Hotels have beds, but nobody says, home, sweet home, when they walk in a hotel room. Home is more than just a place to lay down at night, close your eyes, and go to sleep. Everybody has some place like that. Even the drunk in the jail last night had a place like that. So when Jesus said, the birds have their nests, the foxes have their dens, I don't have any place to lay my head. He meant more than just having some place to get in out of the rain. 
He was talking about the home I'm talking about. I want to lay my head down. I'll tell you where he wanted to lay his head down. The same place John wanted to lay his head down. John wanted to lay his head on the breast of his beloved. And Jesus wanted to lay his head on the breast of his beloved. That's the home he was looking for. He wanted to find the fulfillment of his own heart, of his own person. So this home thing has to work two ways. He must be fulfilled in me as well as I must be fulfilled in him. Here in John 20 in the passage that I read, listen carefully. If a man love me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him. We will come unto him and make our abode with him. Now, that was his answer to Thomas, not, or Judas, not Iscariot, who said, How will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? For he had said that if anybody loved him, he said, My Father's going to love you, and I'm going to manifest myself to you, and then I and my Father are going to come and take up our abode in you. And the word manifest, listen, means self-apparent. Self-apparent. It means to exhibit fully the person. It means to disclose fully who you are. It means a full revelation of who and what you are. That's connected with home. Do you see the connection? He said, I and my Father are going to come and take up our abode in you. We're going to be at home in you. But this home will be a two-way street, and it will be home, sweet home. I will fully reveal myself, fully disclose myself, exhibit my whole person until my whole self is apparent to you. And you will become self-apparent to me. And you will exhibit your whole person and disclose yourself fully so that I will be at home in you and you will be at home in me. Isn't that wonderful? Home, therefore, is connected <laughs> with the freedom, whatever you want to call it, the liberty the blessed experience of being able to be fully who I am, fully disclosed, fully manifest, fully revealed, and yet loved, accepted, and wanted. Is that connected with home? Think about it. And now you see my reference to wanting to go back to my little bed because as I look back as a little boy, a little boy, not when I got to be an ordinary teenager, but when I was a little boy, uninhibited, I was just who I was, good, bad, and indifferent, wasn't I, Mother? And I fully revealed myself, fully manifested myself, fully exhibited myself, and yet... I went to bed at night with the warmth and the secure feeling in my heart that I was still loved, still wanted, and still home. You with me? Now in this little passage in John here where he says, I and my Father will come and take up our abode in Him. Interesting enough, this word abode is the same word used in the first part of John 14, but it's translated mansion. I and my Father will come and take up our mansion in you. In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, wow. home is complicated, isn't it? There are many, 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 many Opportunities and staying places in my Father for full revelation and full exhibit of yourself without rejection. And now, I and my Father are going to come and you will be our mansion where we can fully expose ourselves to you, fully reveal ourselves to you, and you will be our mansion. And 
we will become your mansion. You with me? You see, that when you get religion and salvation side by side and take a look at them, you find that they can be separated so neatly, cleanly, <laughs> swiftly, by just laying two words down on top of religion, you put place. On top of salvation, you put person. Religion totally involved with getting to a place. Salvation, people who are saved involved with a person. That's why the churches sing about heaven all the time. Where Jesus is, tis heaven. But that's not really what they mean. What they mean is the golden gates, the pearly gates, and the golden streets, and the walls garnished with precious stones, and how big the temple is, and the tree of life, and the river of life, and all the wonderful things that there are to do in heaven. That's what they mean. They mean being retired permanently from employment. They mean resting on the bank of the great river of life, fishing, socializing, one big picnic from beginning to end. That's what the religious world talks about when they talk about heaven. And that's why they have so many takers, is because that every man would like to do just that. And it seems to every man that a place could fulfill him. That's why he buys a house and is not satisfied until he has turned every board over and changed every color and done everything he can to make it home. And most of the time bitterly disappointed in that he could not transform a house into a home. He would like to have that place. He thinks a place would fulfill him. Ah, but God knows better than that. For God did not make us for that. He made us to find home in him. And there's a big difference, you see, between a place and a person. And I've commented before on the obvious fact that the book of Revelation is the only book in the New Testament that describes the place that the religious world sings about called heaven. And it measures the gates and tells about the pearls and the stones and the gold and all the things that are there and the things that are not there. And the book of Revelation now contains the only description of heaven as a place. Yet in the very introduction to the book, we are told by the Holy Spirit of God that the book will contain the revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so Jesus Christ and the place are the same. And in the end of the book, it says that the spirit of all this prophecy... The meaning of it. You know the difference between the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. The letter of the law is what it says. The spirit of the law is what it means. A judge may be able to send you to prison by the letter of the law, but because he also understands the spirit of the law, many times you're set free. Because he knows that it was not the intent of the law to punish you under your peculiar circumstances. Surely you know the difference between the letter and the spirit. The letter kills. The Spirit gives life. And the writer of Revelation says that the spirit of all this prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. This is what it all means. Don't stay with the letter. The letter will kill you. And I testify this morning that if heaven as a place is all I've got to look forward to, I'm dead already. I've seen all the places I want to see. Haven't you? Seen one place, you've seen them all, and especially you've seen one city, you've seen them all. I'll tell you, heaven's got to be more than a place, my dear people. Because if place is all there is to heaven, just remember that when you get in that place, you will take with you to that place all that is inside of you at this moment. And that place, beautiful as it may be, will turn into hell overnight for you. Heaven's got to be more in a place. It's got to be the fulfillment of myself. It's got to be the full disclosure of who I am and what I am. And find that not only I'm content with it, God's content with it. 
Now I'm going to start telling you a little bit about what home is because we're going to close here shortly. My home, and if you are a believer, the only home you will ever experience is Jesus. Referring back again to the 11th chapter of Hebrews, Abraham testifying that he desired a better country. And Paul mentioning the fact that he was not speaking of Macedonia. He said that he was speaking of a place, a better country where God is not ashamed to be called our God. In the Greek it says that God is not ashamed to be surnamed, quote, our God, unquote. Therefore, I'm just throwing this out for your meditation because i got a question to ask at the end of the message. Just throwing this out. Home is a person. Home is not a place, not any place. A place can be anything, and still men can call it home without it being home. Home is a person, but home is a two-way street. Where I am at home in that person, and that person is at home in me. Now, here's where the two way street comes in. I am told that home, the home that Abraham looked for, the home that made him a pilgrim and a stranger, and a wanderer, and a wayfaring man all the days of his life, gravels in his shoes, as one of my convict friends used to describe himself. Gravels in his shoes. The home that he wanted and the home that I have found is a place where God is not ashamed of me. That's home. Is your home a place where the people who live in it are not ashamed of you? Ah, blessed you are then. Who are not ashamed to be surnamed with your surname? Who proudly and gladly testify that your name and theirs is the same? Oh, you have a home. See, just comparing earthly homes with spiritual homes. I have a home. I think that the only place in the universe where this may be true for me is that home Abraham spoke about. I want you to know that in my home, that's Jesus. God is not ashamed of me. So much so that He gladly takes my surname. We've heard a lot about me being identified with Him. Here is God being identified with me. God saying, yes, we have the same name. What is that name? It's Jesus. That's what the name is. He not only has given me the privilege of wearing that precious name, the same as Jesus wearing it, He wears it Himself. God wears it. And He said, I'm not ashamed. So home is a place where you can live and walk and fully reveal yourself and be who you are and nobody's ashamed of you. <laughs> you know what home is. You know, you can sit there and watch TV in your underwear if you want to and nobody puts you down for it. Nobody says, that's uncouth. You ought to at least have a house coat on. Or is that what women wear? House coat. <laughs> I have to make it real to you, you know. You can just be who you are. Nobody's ashamed of you. That's a part of home. Jesus said in, in Mark 5, he said to the maniac, he said, Go home to thy friends. And in Luke 15, he as the great shepherd, when he found his sheep, he said he carried it, put it on his shoulder, and he took it home. And when he got home, he called his friends. So if you have a home, then you have a home where the people there are your friends. That's a part of home, isn't it? Friends. Jesus is my home. And Jesus is filled with my friends. 
Every Christian on the face of the earth is in Jesus. That's my home. And at home with Jesus and my friends. Well, what, what's friends all about? Well, when, I, when I'm with friends, I don't feel like I'm a stranger. You ever, you ever uh, been with somebody and you said suddenly, you know, I, f- I feel at home. I feel at home. It wasn't the house. It wasn't the place. It was that person made you feel at home. Why? Because you took off the shoes of the little man inside. And maybe even the clothes of the little man inside. And you sat down naked and yet you were unashamed. And felt yourself fully accepted and approved and welcomed. You with me? That's why you felt at home. Might have been in the strangest kind of building. Might have been a million miles from your earthly home. But suddenly you said, I feel at home here. Why do you feel at home? Because you were among friends. You were with those who were not ashamed to be surnamed with you. Home is a place where you loved. Jesus loves me. This I know. Not just where people say they love you, it's where you loved. And you know it. And you feel it. And you sense it, even though it may not be said in words. Even though they may not write on the blackboard, I love you. Or they may not start today with the words, I love you. When love exists, nobody has to announce its presence. It overwhelms you with the reality of its presence. Home is where I'm loved. Really. And know it. Even a dog knows when he's loved. How much more we who were created in the image of God, who is said to be love. Home is where we're loved, not liked. Home is where we are loved for who we really are, not for who we're supposed to be. Home is where we are loved for who we truly are, not appreciated for the service that we render. Home is where we are wanted, not merely used. Home is where we are welcomed, not tolerated. Home is where we are worshipped, yet not patronized. Home, ask a bride where home is, and she will tell you. It's him. That's where home is. It's a person. You can put a bride and groom in the grubbiest uh, motel or seaside cottage or shack in the world, and they're not missing a thing. Why? Because that is the one moment when they ultimately find the fulfillment of each other in each other. We're not talking about sex and going to bed. We're talking about a man and a woman having found each other in the eyes of each other. Ask a bride where home is and she'll tell you. Ask Rebecca if she was at home in Sarah's tent. Hey, she was hundreds of miles away from home. And she'd been on the road a long time when Isaac loved her took her into his mother's tent and loved her. Ask Rebecca through the peephole in the tent, Are you at home? She'd say, I'm at home at last. I had never had a home before this moment. This is my home. They said, What kind of a home is this? It's an old dingy tent. It's wore out. Sarah had it for years. She said, I'm not talking about the tent. I'm not talking about the place. I'm not talking about what keeps the rain out. I'm talking about me being at home. I'm at home in Isaac. And Isaac is at home in me. He said here in John 14, 27, 
He spoke of home further when he talked about coming and taking up his abode in me, making his mansion in me, making his home in me. He said, I'm going to give you my peace and I'm going to leave my peace with you. You say, what is peace? He told us. You will not be afraid and your heart will not be troubled. Now on Christmas Day when you're at home, will you not be afraid? And will your heart not be troubled? And is peace a word you can describe what you feel down inside? You'll truly be home for Christmas if that's true. Let me tell you a little more about home. It's a place where you feel secure. That is, your future is not threatened. Tomorrow doesn't weigh in the balance, nor depend on how well I perform or don't perform. Home is secure. It's there forever. It's something that can't be changed, and you know it down inside, that it's always going to be like this. Because if you're truly home, you've found out what home really is, and nothing will ever change that. You may change houses a hundred times in this life. But if you found home in a person, you take that home with you wherever you go if that person happens to be Jesus. Secure. I read a couple of books on architecture one time. And uh, I've been a great why man all my life. I got to ask why, 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 why. So I wanted to design a house one time, and I thought, I sat down to draw the blueprints, and as I looked at what I'd drawn, I began to question everything with a big why. Why do we always do this? Why do we always do that? Why? For instance, pardon me for putting in such a foolish thing as this, but why do we always have three pieces of plumbing in one room? Why couldn't you take a bath in one room, brush your teeth someplace else if you wanted to? Why? What's the purpose in all of it? Is there, is there some purpose? Have people, you know, uh, traveled that road one other time and came to the conclusion that this is the way it ought to be after trial and error, and I just haven't discovered that yet? Why? So I got a couple of books on architects, and I read them. And oh, I was fascinated to find out that most of the uh, conventional methods that we use in designing houses and in building houses have a very, very good sound reason behind it all. Reasons I hadn't thought of. And I was enlightened when I read the books. Boy, I started to tell you was, that uh, I'd always been fascinated with an open fire. I love an open fireplace. And I think um, about everybody does. And the only people probably present in this hall or hearing this message that don't like an open fireplace are the people who had to carry wood for it and carry the ashes out. But all of you will admit that you love to sit by it. Especially if somebody else is bringing the logs in and carrying the ashes out. I've been fascinated with an open fireplace. I love it. I can sit and look in an open fireplace for hours. Get lost in it. There's a feeling that comes sitting there in front of that open fire. And I thought, why is this? And it's kind of universal. And here is a big chapter in my book on architecture about fireplaces. And here's what it said. But this goes way back, they said, to the caveman days. When fire was all they had, and home was built around that fire, not the fire built around the home. Today we build fires in our home. Then they built the home around the fire. Is there a difference? And the fire, they lived in caves or sheltered places, and the fire was always way back inside, the deepest, warmest place there. So that when a man started home after being out there in the jungle all day, the first thing he could see was the fire. And he was drawn down inside to the heart of that cave where the warmth was and where love was, where security was. So fire did more than warm them, and fire did more than cook their meals. Fire also protected them from the wild beasts. 
gave him light. And that's what home is, and that's what I have in Jesus. I have warmth. I have light. I have protection. And after a long, weary day out here in this jungle, I look for the fireside. I look for the hearth. It's home. And I run back to his arms like a caveman running in out of the jungle to sit by the side of the fire. I have security. And it's a place of rest. Time stands still when you're at home. Remember back yonder when I was that little boy? I used to get my toys out in the morning. In the summertime, I used to like to play cars on the back porch because we had a back porch three or four feet off the ground, just dirt under it. And I didn't have cars like the kids have now. I had one maybe or two. But I'd get under there in the dirt and play all day long and run my cars and build little roads and little intersections and tunnel out garages and places to put them and just play. And, hey, I was oblivious to time. I couldn't have told you whether it was noon or six o'clock in the morning. The only thing I listen for is supper time, bedtime. I was at rest. I didn't worry about tomorrow. Didn't care about yesterday. Just taken up in an ever-present now. Where my wishes and my dreams and everything was fulfilled. I was at home. And I knew if I needed to eat, Mother would call me. <laughs> if I needed to sleep, Daddy would tell me to go to bed. If I needed something else, they were looking after it, not me. I was just enjoying myself. And so it was a place of rest where time stood still. And when you're home, brethren, isn't this wonderful? You don't want to go anyplace. When you're home, you don't want to do anything except be there. Why? There isn't any place to go. You're there. There isn't anything to do. You're doing it. Though you may be doing nothing. Oh, in Jesus, there's no place to go. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to want. You throw your wristwatch and your calendar away. Time stands still. You're never made to do what you don't want to do, and you're always doing what you want to do. Jesus is home because it's there that I am fully, personally fulfilled. Oh, listen to what I mean by that. I gave you this little word, idios, pertaining to self. One's very own. Here I have my very own lover. You say, Jesus belongs to me too. Of course he does. But not the Jesus that belongs to me. He's mine. You have a Jesus, I have one. You say, oh, there's more than one Jesus? Yes. There's as many Jesuses as there are people. Now, I know this will get all bent out of shape out there in tape land, so before I hear get any letters from you, people say, why are you preaching this crazy doctrine? There is one true God. Don't send me any scripture. Each one of us are unique, and we were created uniquely for the unique revelation of the unique God to each of us. How can I be the bride of Christ and all other Christians his bride too? Is he a polygamist? How can he be my groom and yours too? Is he an adulterer? Oh no, God has revealed himself uniquely to each person in whom Christ dwells. And if there are a billion Christians... It would take the sharing of a billion hearts together to even begin to bring into focus the fullness of him who is everything. And he's mine. He's mine uniquely. 
No one will ever have a revelation, a personal revelation of the Lord Jesus to their heart like I've had to mine. You have a unique personal revelation of the Lord Jesus and a unique personal relationship to him, just as I have. Oh, he's mine, idios, mine, one thing that's mine. You parents, now that it's Christmas time, be careful to cultivate this in your children because it's necessary. I found that my children, when they were little, were fascinated with anything that could be locked up. Yeah, have you found that out? Like a toolbox with a lock on it. Like a footlocker with a lock on it. Like a diary with a lock on it. Do you know why? Because each little boy and each little girl has this natural desire down inside to have something that's uniquely theirs. And I really feel sorry for the child that's never given any rights of personal ownership. Has to share all his shirts with his brother. Or she has to share all her dresses with her sister. You know, when you go out and you wear a shirt, you like to say, that's my shirt. You may have bought one like it down at J.C. Penney's yesterday, but this isn't mine. And I don't wear it today. My brother wears it tomorrow. My other brother wears it the next day. And then I go out and somebody says, oh, I see you got your brother's shirt on. And, and, and you know, this wearing hand-me-downs, that's okay. But what if you ain't got nothing but sisters? <laughs> you know, children, children need, don't they need something that's uniquely theirs? And I think sometimes parents make an awful mistake in that. You know, they buy one bicycle for seven kids. And they say, okay, we couldn't afford seven bicycles, so it belongs to everybody. You know, I'd rather buy no bicycles than buy one for seven. I know what it was like to have my own bicycle. I know what it was like when Daddy took me down to the old Sears Roebuck store and, and bought me a bicycle. Hey, there wasn't no bicycle like that on the face of the earth. You know why? It was mine. I'd ridden my brother's old broken down bicycles for so long I was half crippled. Trying to get up on them because it was too high. The ends of my toes tore off and catch them in the chains. I had my own bicycle. It was mine. He even stopped at the Sunoco station and got me a little Sunoco sign with my initials on it. And I got a picture of that bicycle today. That was my bicycle. That's why it was so precious. It wasn't much of a bicycle compared to some of the bicycles the richer boys had, but I want to tell you one thing. It was mine. It was idios. It was my unique possession. And my home is my unique possession. It's Jesus. And he is uniquely mine. It's where the son feels like he's a part because it belongs to the family. It's where the bride says, this is my home because it's my grooms. It's where the citizen says, it's my land and I'm proud of it. It's where a dying man begins to live. Home is where a, well, a sick man is made well. Home is where a poor man is rich. Home is where a worthless man feels and knows his worth as he sees it in the eyes of those who love him. Home is where the base are exalted. where those who are not noble become nobility, where the weak are made strong, where the foolish are always wise. It's where soldiers fight no more, and sailors finally land. Home is the place outside of which you never want to be. But home is a person. Spiritually, home is a person. Actually. I have a question to ask you. Will you really be home for Christmas? Will you be home? I'll be home. Will Jesus get home for Christmas? 
I'm his home. Oh, I want to make him welcome in it. I want to make him feel at home. I want to clean it up for him. I want to entertain him. That's what homes are for, isn't it? I want to welcome him. I want him to just make him feel like he don't ever have to go anyplace else or ever have to be anywhere else or ever have to be anything else. I want him to be at home. He wants that for me. Will you truly be at home earthly wise for Christmas? Or will you just be going through the motions? Will you feel that peace I'm talking about where there's no fear? Where your heart's not troubled? Where you can be fully who you are and be accepted? Where you can take the shoes off the little man inside and let his hair down and be just who he is and sense that warmth of love? I hope that's the way it will be for you. God bless you. And may every one of us be home for Christmas.